So what was the most challenging operation that you had to take care of during the NATO, with NATO? What was, what's the most challenging aspect of your job at that time? Um, so I think uh, the most challenging aspect of it is is really you know the uh, building consensus uh, among the you know among the different um, within the organization in our headquarters in particular uh, there were 28 allied and partner nations that were represented in terms of personnel so we had you know officers and non-commissioned officers and you know personnel from all the 28 different countries that were part of. Uh, NATO Allied Land Command. In my directorate, the director of uh, directorate of uh, intelligence, uh, we have 15 different nations that were represented. Welcome to the Excellent International Leadership Podcast. Your host today works with the world's leading experts on international leadership, helping them find purpose and implement their vision. She's a master certified coach and facilitates a mastermind for CEOs of international companies. She's the author of three books and works with Nestle, Novartis, and even the United Nations. She's especially good at helping executives fast track to the C-suite. Welcome, Dr. Katrina Bruce. How does one find consensus from different countries in NATO? because each nation has its own priorities. Well, let's ask Derek Lee, who has extensive military experience and experience in multinational alliance operation. How was consensus reached, if at all? He also shares what his military experience brought to the private sector. Welcome to the Excellent International Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Katrina Birus, and today we have Derek Lee. Derek, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Good to be here. So you have a very interesting background. You've worked for the military and for 30 years in the intelligence. So tell us a little bit about what is it that you do in the intelligence. So, so for people that don't understand what is being expert in intelligence, what it means. In terms of uh, military intelligence, the first and foremost, uh, our task is to really kind of analyze what we would call threat situation. So if we're talking about, you know, U.S. Army or U.S. Army organizations, uh, depending on the operations or mission that we're executing, what are the potential adversary or threats and, and so the key element of it is, is collecting information uh, on the adversary in, in the context of the broader operational environment. Uh, so, you know, where we're operating. And then basically to determine uh, w- what are the likely courses of action uh, from either the adversary or the threat that could impact our mission or, or operation. Uh, and we do that through a number of different means in terms of collecting information and then really kind of synthesizing, pulling out the key elements of, you know, those you know, collected information and then deriving a, uh, at an assessment or conclusion on, hey, this is what the threat will likely do in the future in order to either disrupt our operations or to threaten, you know, our personnel and so forth. So that, that is the, uh, uh, in, a, in a short summary. Yes, I know it's a short summary, but g- you gave us an example before the podcasting started about Russia in 2021. Can you give us a, that example of uh, determining what kind of intelligence you gathered there? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And to uh, kind of keep, you know, so I'll keep it at an unclassified level. A- at the time in 2021, I was assigned to what is called the NATO Allied Land Command, which is in, which is a, uh, what we would call three-star headquarters uh, that's in charge of all the ground operations on behalf of NATO, uh, of um, all the 30 uh, nations that are part of NATO. In 2021, one of the things that we were monitoring pretty closely was the Russian uh, military activity. Uh, in particular, uh, in and around Ukraine. Uh, the Russians, you know, every year, uh, Russian armed forces conduct uh, a major exercise uh, in you know, each one of the strategic directions to really kind of exercise their mobilization and then really the training aspect of it to conduct, conduct the combat operations. 2021 in particular, uh, what we noticed was uh, a bit of an abnormal activity in terms of the size and scope of the units that were mobilized 
and where they were mobilizing to. Uh, and traditionally, you know, at the conclusion of the exercise, uh, the units will deploy into training areas and then they'll redeploy back, meaning that they'll take all their equipment and everything back to their garrison locations. In this year in particular, uh, they left a set sizable chunk of their equipment at those locations where they conducted training, uh, which you know we thought was in particular you know very abnormal. That in itself is not a good indication that a you know invasion or likely you know something something will happen because you know what what they do is they also kind of vary up their activities and give a different look so that they're not so predictable in terms of you know uh, telegraphing their you know likely. Uh, uh, future operations and so forth. So, so we're monitoring that pretty closely, you know, through a lot of different means in order to really kind of, you know, try to discern, is this just um, abnormal kind of a provocation type of activity, or is this an actual preparation for, for war? You know, come to find out February of 2022, it was the latter, uh, that it was indeed, you know, uh, part of um, preparation, you know, for those pieces. But I think, you know, in you know a lot of different aspects of it, that's very difficult to determine leading up to the uh, leading up to the actual event itself. So, what was the most challenging uh, operation that you had to take care of during the uh, NATO with NATO? What was what's the most challenging aspect of your job at that time? Um, so, I think uh, the most challenging aspect of it is is really you know the uh, building consensus uh, among the you know among the different. Um, within the organization. In our headquarters in particular, uh, there were 28 allied and partner nations that were represented in terms of personnel. So we had you know, officers and non-commissioned officers and you know, personnel from all the 28 different countries that were part of uh, NATO Allied Land Command. In my directorate, the director of, uh, Directorate of uh, Intelligence, uh, we have 15 different nations that were represented. In terms of really kind of looking at the organization itself, although it's a unified organization under a uh, kind of a singular uh, command structure organization, uh, certainly there's a lot of, uh, I think, national interests and, you know, those type of things that come in uh, because of, you know, the personnel from different countries that are coming in and they're what we will call national command authority or their nation's leadership has certain priorities in terms of, you know, their military operations and, you know, how they look at the threat. So uh, you mentioned so, earlier uh, the people around Russia, the countries around Russia had one priority, the European countries another. Can you uh, share that with us? No, absolutely. And so, you know, when we look at, you know, really the, the primary threats, you know, against NATO, you know, there's, you know, a number of different threats, uh, Russia being a threat. Uh, one of the other pieces is, you know, the violent extremism uh, that are kind of emanating from Northern Africa, Middle East, and then, you know, that have, you know, kind of infiltrated into, into, the, uh, into the European, you know, uh, soil as well uh, in terms of a lot of different, you know, factors. So, so that's always a concern, uh, potential what we will call malign uh, Chinese influence, uh, you know, in different parts of the world is, is a concern. Uh, and then, you know, situation in the Middle East too, uh, the Levant, because of its proximity uh, to to Europe, is also you know always concerned. And for those countries that are bordering Russia, you know, Poland, uh, Romania, uh, the Baltic uh, Baltic states, their, their threat is you know their priority is you know Russia is the number one threat by and large. And and, uh, and then if you kind of move further a little bit to the west, because of you know geographical and other consideration. There's other pressing issues uh, like the migration, the refugee flow from from uh, the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, and then potential you know associated you know threats of uh, violent extremism and terrorism that tend to flow in with those you know uh, large movements of personnel and and certainly you know the movements of personnel that, you know, itself is creating a lot of problems in the border areas. You know those nations' uh, prioritization of threat tends to kind of shift towards that. And Russia and some of the other threats, you know, uh, that the Eastern European countries are kind of contending with, uh, is not as uh, as a high priority in that regard. So, so how do you manage that and get a consensus, which is super difficult? I don't know if you ever get the whole consensus, uh, but I think the key thing is, is, you know, at the end of the day, we're a military organization, so you know, it's very easy to say, hey, look, I don't care, you know, what it is. This is what we're, you know, what we're 
you know, being told to do, so we're going to go ahead and execute the mission. And we could just basically, you know, give an order and just, you know, you know, proverbial everybody just shut up and color. But I think it's, you know, my experience over the years is that even though it's, you know, kind of difficult to do, is to really kind of explain uh, the the genesis behind the orders in the strategic context of why we need to do what we need to do. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's a pretty lengthy discussion, uh, you know, a lot of exchanges, but I think, you know, one thing that uh, I think has worked well is that one, you hear everybody out uh, because people, officers from different nations will come with different concerns, uh, different, you know, kind of viewpoints. And I think it's important to really kind of table all the viewpoints, table all the, all the concerns, and then have a good discussion in terms of how we're going to get to where we're going to get to. Uh, and then, you know, prioritization of effort. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, you know, being, you know, we're all professional officers and we're going to, you know, and, you know, personnel, we're going to do what, you know, what we are told to do, but having that uh, kind of explanation and that, um, the reason why we're doing it uh, makes it, you know, tends to make it, you know, go a little bit smoother. And I've had similar experience, even within U.S. you know, U.S. only organizations as well. Is really kind of providing that why and the explanation, even to the most junior members of the team, uh, goes a long way in terms of really kind of uh, accomplishing the mission, uh, if you will, because I think it provides a better context and it allows people to take. A little bit more of an initiative in terms of, you know, doing their daily tasks, whereas, you know, they're not just, you know, executing tasks one through 10, like they're told, but they're able to kind of think through the mission set uh, and, you know, the greater context of why, we, why we're doing what we're doing. And I think that just creates a better uh, kind of a operational environment. So it uh, helps uh, consensus, it helps team building to explain the, the background, the context, and also it uh, helps to admit members be more proactive, not maybe proactive or more thinking it through what's the best situation or reaction to have. So very good. And you have worked well uh, leading various levels of organization in your careers. How um, do you manage the different levels of the organization? Because uh, the layman thinks that the military is very hierarchical. So tell us a little bit about that. At various different levels, you know, in terms of uh, span of response, responsibility, I think it's uh, it varies differently. You know, so when I was a company commander uh, in charge of about you know uh, about sixty personnel, the management style was very what we would call down. I was very focused on the you know organization, and that's where I got to know all my soldiers and all my personnel very well because I'm always you know you know looking down and you know really kind of. You know, down into the organization and just making sure that you know they're being taken care of. They're doing you know the, those things that that we need to do in order to accomplish the mission. As you uh, kind of go up into higher echelons, I think uh, you have to delegate more because uh, you know you can't be just you know always focusing on within the organization because then you're kind of missing the the, the greater picture. So I think an example that was given to you know to me by one of my mentors is that as you as you go up. The ratio of you know down and in versus up and out. Down and in means you're, you're focused, you know, within your organization and you're being kind of really kind of being closely involved. Up and out means you know you're interacting more with your higher headquarters. You're interacting more with your adjacent organization and really kind of looking at the greater kind of a strategic picture. That ratio kind of shifts. Um, so if you're at a level where you're commanding, you know, about 500 personnel, you're Ratio is about 70 30, meaning 70, you're down, 30, you're, you're you know, up and out. It's um, just more strategic overview. A so little, bit, little bit more focused in. Little bit oh, more oh focused you mean in. at the higher your level, uh, you're 30% focused in and 70% having an overview? Is that what you're saying? And coordinating um, between different organizations? Organization, or, or, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're looking at about, you know, say, you know, what we call a battalion, uh, which is about 500, you know, yeah. personnel, uh, give and take, and that's about 70% down and about 30% out. Oh, if you I go see. to the next level, yeah. where it's about 2,000, 3,000 personnel, then it, the ratio shifts. So it's about 30% down because you got subordinate battalion commanders that are, you know, looking down. Now you're 70% up and out because, you know, you have to, you know, look a little bit more, you know, and that ratio shifts, you know, 
ever more so as, as you progress up is uh, that uh, you have to be able to kind of take a look at the greater strategic context Absolutely. and then bring that, bring that down and set the priorities for your organization right. based on, you know, the requirements that are, you know, kind of, that are out there. So does, uh, are you prepared to do that shift or does it come on the job? Or are you coached in some way? There isn't like a coaching program, although there is a lot of, you know, kind of preparatory courses uh, that does that, but, <clears throat> but it varies. I think it depends on the person uh, and some do it very well. Uh, some don't do it as well. Uh, and so you have, you know, commanders at, at that level where, you know, they're not looking up and out. They're comfortable with, you know, being focused down and in. So they continue to do that. And sometimes they miss, you know, some of the pictures, whereas some of the others are more comfortable doing this. So I think it varies. Uh, and it, a lot of it comes from experience. And, you know, just kind of looking back on my experience, a lot of my, um, I learned a lot from over the years observing different leaders uh, that I serve with and how they, you know, did things. And so I uh, always made it a pain to, you know, I mean, you, you could always, you know, you learn a lot from great leaders, but sometimes you learn more from uh, not a bad leader, but a leader that is not as, you know, and, and so I think, you know, from that aspect of it, you know, the um, over the over the years, just observation and, you know, just kind of, you know, taking a look at it you know, does give, you know, quite a bit of insights into yeah, how to proceed. Yeah, very interesting. But it's a uh, it's a major shift. I followed. Uh, several people in their careers that were CEOs of big multinationals and then became chairman. The shift was tremendous to see all of a sudden it was big issues like water or food uh, and how that will pan out over time. And even like the CERN, it's like what they can do now to have an effect in 20, 30 years. So also with time span, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So what now that you're no longer in the military system, per se, in the military, but you're doing, tell us a little bit about your job currently and what you bring to the job with that experience. Sure. So uh, I'm uh, working for uh, one of the uh, defense contracting companies, uh, working as a, um, a director of an intelligence program. So still working kind of closely within the government. Uh, the, you know, my company does a lot of, uh, you know, the personnel contracting support for both the uh, Department of Defense and other uh, civilian agencies, you know, within uh, within the U.S. government. You know, what I really kind of, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing that I bring is the, the experience uh, from the client or customer perspective, uh, because a lot of the organizations that we're supporting, uh, I used to be part of when I was in uniform. So... Uh, from, from that side of the house, uh, I could I could see what the requirements are. Being on this side, bring some perspective on how to provide better support, uh, better services, uh, better expertise, and potentially streamlining some of the processes and you know those type of things to make it so that uh, what the what the uh, the client or you know the government you know, customer is looking for, uh, we could we could go ahead and uh, meet that. Let's see. Fascinating. So what would you say to your younger self? What would you advise your younger self like 30 years ago? I would say, um, you know, learn those things that I didn't have a lot of interest in learning. So such as uh, <laughs> such as uh, finances, uh, yeah. like budget uh, within the military. I think you know, there are personnel and folks that, you know, focus on the finances and budget, you know, within an organization, how, you know, how to project budget, how to, how to spend money, basically, in order to uh, uh, conduct operations and so forth. And even when I was um, in the position to approve some of those budgets, um, I did not pay very close detail to, like, the ins and outs into each one of the lines, as long as uh, the general kind of concept of budget execution was in accordance with the mission requirements and I you know trusted my subordinates to really kind of you know do that portion of it which is, which they did an absolutely great job of in terms of you know meeting the requirement uh, but uh, looking back uh, just just for my own you know both personal and professional kind of you know uh, perspective I kind of wish that I would have paid a little bit more attention and studied that a little more in, in terms of hey this is how to how, how this portion works, this is the, you know, the, where that comes from and how that's executed and so forth. And I think 
uh, that aspect of it, you know, um, uh, again, you know, given you know, there's probably not enough uh, hours in the day, but I probably would have taken a little bit more time away from something else and, you know, spent a, a little bit more time on that. Because it came most useful later on in your career when you had Absolutely. to manage a budget, right? <laughs> right. And doing all the forecasting and those type of things, which, yeah, I did not have to do like, you know, uh, myself. So. Well, you've had a fascinating career. Uh, so very interesting. So we're coming to the end of our podcast. I wanted to know, where can people get a hold of you? Um, sure. So, uh, I mean, you know, through my uh, LinkedIn profile, uh, there's, you know, uh, certainly that. Uh, I think my email is listed there uh, as well, D-E-R-I-C-K-S-L-E-93 at gmail.com. So, and, you know, folks have reached out on a number of different things, you know, through, you know, both my uh, personal email and through LinkedIn. So. Well, thank you very much, Derek. The most interesting. Take care. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for listening to the Excellent International Leadership Podcast. You can subscribe to all future podcasts at excellentexecutivecoaching.com and select podcasts. Join us each Thursday to learn more about the latest trends in leadership techniques and bring your leadership to the next level. To learn more about Dr. Burris's coaching programs, and the International Leadership Mastermind, use the contact form at excellentexecutivecoaching.com.